therapist who's worked with children, youth, and adults who have complex disabilities in western Montana since 1983. She specializes in and is passionate about wheelchair seating and mobility and 24-hour postural management. She has written and presented about these topics in the United States, Japan, and Peru, and she'll be teaching in Medellin, Colombia this fall. Tamara is project director for the Montana Postural Care Project, funded by the Montana Council on Development Disabilities. And she's also director of Eleanor's project, promoting postural care and responsible wheelchair provision in Peru. Um, she gives her daughter Eleanor credit for being her best teacher, and we're going to hear, I think, something more about that. But please join me in welcoming Tamara to the lecture series tonight. Thank you, thank you. You can all hear me okay? I'm all wired up with two microphones here. I'm really happy to be able to be here and talk about my passions. Um, I'm going to be able to talk with you about the folks that I care so much about. I get to use my daughter Eleanor's name a lot and talk with you about the work that I've um, pretty much devoted myself to for quite a few years now. Um, this is just a little list of some of the stuff that I've done, um, some of the specialties that I've, I've um, entered into. But what it doesn't say on here, we'll talk about the mother piece in a minute, but what it doesn't say here is a term that I'm adopting from one of my friends who is part of the Eleanor's Project family, a wonderful therapist named Kim who lives in New Hampshire. About three years ago, at one point, she used the term being a foot soldier for our population. And I love that term, so I'm not going to take credit for it, but I'm going to adopt it. Because I think if I were going to describe myself, it would be that I really want to be a foot soldier for the population of people with complex disabilities. And by complex disabilities, I mean not just a, a little one-off diagnosis. We're talking about people who have real significant motor development. Um, issues, um, motor disabilities, oftentimes um, seizures, um, health issues that leave them medically fragile. Um, folks who are pretty complex and who don't necessarily get a lot of press. Um, you, all, you all probably know a lot about um, Autism Speaks and the Down Syndrome Association and there are many wonderful organizations that are supporting those populations. Um, but the people we're going to be talking about today are people who are often largely forgotten and not served very well, and not only in less resourced countries, but also in our country as well. So that's me, the foot soldier for people with developmental disabilities. Now this is um, my beautiful daughter, Eleanor. She was our third child and left us, as you see, in 2001. And when she was born, I was an early intervention occupational therapist at the Child Development Center here in Missoula. I'd done my master's in early intervention, and I knew, because it was a regional program, I knew almost every family in western Montana at the time who had a kid with cerebral palsy. And then I gave birth to one of my own. I'd been a therapist for about 11 years, and it was a huge change for me to figure out how to balance my professional life and being the mother of a child with special needs, who, as it turned out, did not only have cerebral palsy, but also was profoundly deaf, even though we didn't find that out until she was almost five years of age. So Eleanor, who is a beautiful, wonderful person, 
started life with some real challenges. And she was my entry into what it really is like to be a family member, a caregiver of a person with complex needs. And that's a little entry that a lot of us who are professionals never really get a chance to experience. <coughs> so after Eleanor died, um, we wanted to do something to give her a legacy. And it made a lot of sense to us to focus on the sorts of needs that we had learned through our life experience were important to her. So we really wanted to improve the quality of life for children with disabilities and their families in less resource settings. This is right out of our bylaws. But we wanted to do it internationally, both because my husband Rick, who's sitting back here, and I already had an international bent, having spent time as volunteers in India in the late 80s before Eleanor joined our family. Um, but also because I had kind of a reputation around the state of Montana, and I wanted to do a legacy for Eleanor that was going to be separate from people who knew me in this state. And through us, so through us, a set of circumstances, we ended up creating Eleanor's project. Um, we began in 2004. Um, earned our, or were given our 501c3 status on her birthday, actually, in 2004. And we continue on in Peru to this day. We also worked in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan from 2006 to 2009. And today you will see a few pictures of kids from our time working in Jordan as well. That came about because we had a da another daughter, our oldest daughter, who was a Peace Corps volunteer in Jordan, who um, ended up helping us get involved there for a while. So currently, just to refresh your memory about where Peru is, South America is a really big continent. And here is, South, here is Peru. It's considered to be in northern South America. And if we're going to look closer at Peru, here are some of the major cities. You've all heard about Machu Picchu, right? Everybody who hears that we go to Peru wants to know if we've gone to Machu Picchu. And yes, we have, and it's really wonderful. Um, but there's a lot of other wonderful things there as well. Um, chief among them, the people that we've gotten to know. And more specifically, where we're really going to be talking about today is a section of Lima, which I've circled for you here or squared for you, a section of Lima called San Juan de Luragancho, which is a really poor and quite crime-ridden part in the district of Lima. It's the kind of place where most tourists don't go. You don't really go there unless you have a reason to. So our focus is on significant motor disabilities. Now, according to the World Health Organization, the most recent stats that I've been able to find, about 15% of the world population experiences disability, and about 10% of those have a motor disability that requires a wheelchair. Roughly 300,000 people in Peru need wheelchairs, and a minority actually have them. 235,000 people in Peru still need wheelchairs and don't have them out of the 3,000 who need them. So that's a pretty big gap here that, that we're looking at. We also need to take into consideration what is an appropriate wheelchair versus just a chair with wheels. And so in order for you to understand what we're doing in Peru, I'm going to have to give you a really brief primer on what is an appropriate wheelchair and what is not and what is 24-hour postural care, so that then you will understand the importance of this work and why I'm so excited about what's happening in Peru. So appropriate wheelchairs are more than chairs with wheels, right? Any of you have any familiarity or any experience with wheelchairs at all? Nobody? OK. Well, I am a, I am a diet in the flesh wheelchair geek, and I could talk about it all night, which I won't. But I've been doing wheelchairs for about 30 years and helping people get the equipment that they need. And these are not appropriate wheelchairs. As you can see, this is basically a plastic lawn chair. Somebody's cut off the legs, and they have put wheels on it and called it a wheelchair. Thousands and thousands of these were sent to Peru at one point in time. We're not seeing as many of them now but we still see some. Um, they were from an organization called Free Wheelchair Mission. People, for like 50 bucks, they could sponsor one of these wheelchairs. Caused lots of problems. And you can see this little guy, whom we met in Cusco, Peru, was actually tied into the chair, because if he wasn't tied into it, he would have slid right out. This little person in Jordan 
actually was sliding out of the wheelchair. There was no way that he was able to sit in there and maintain his posture. And because he wasn't strapped in, he was sliding right out. So these are examples of inappropriate wheelchairs that are not properly fitting. They don't meet the person's need. Um, there's a lot more to it than just putting a person in a chair with wheels. Here's an example of um, a person in an inappropriate wheelchair who is now fitted into an appropriate wheelchair, one that fits his body and that meets his needs. Um, this was done by our colleagues at Yankanawasi and they shared the photos with us. So you can see a pretty big difference in how this guy is sitting and how unstable he is and um, how much better off he is in this situation, physically, socially, in every way. You look at a person like this who looks like he might fall out any moment and you're not quite as inclined to want to interact with him as you are with this person over here. Same guy. So, the thing we want to talk about today is that time spent outside the wheelchair can be destructive or therapeutic. A person may have an appropriate wheelchair, but if when they're not in the wheelchair, they're hanging out in destructive postures, such as this, it's going to hurt their body and their health in the long term, if not in the short term. This is a boy that we just met about four weeks ago in Lima, Peru at Yankanawasi. Um, this is a posture that is called apostatness. I heard that some of you might be pre-med students. Maybe someday you will hear that term. It's not something that we see in this country all that much anymore, but we still do sometimes see it. I've had a few clients here in Montana who have this extreme extension posture. And if you spend all of your time in this kind of posture when you're out of your wheelchair, and of course this boy at age 10 had never had a wheelchair before, you end up with a really distorted body shape. And we're going to talk about why that happens. In contrast, this is the very same boy, relaxed and in a much better aligned position because he's been supported in a comfortable, relaxed position. And you're going to learn a lot more about that. So secondary complications. Um, diagnoses like cerebral palsy, spina bifida, muscular dystrophy, some of you might have heard of some of those things. Secondary complications can make a person's life horrific. Now this is not, this picture is not anybody I ever knew, obviously. My husband found that picture for me on the internet and gave it to me as an image that I could use when teaching. But this person obviously had an incredibly complex scoliosis with rotation and twisting. And what we need to remember when we look at this sort of a, an image is what was going on with that person's heart, lungs, digestive tract, all those things inside that skeleton. And I can guarantee you that if the person didn't die because of that, the health was certainly compromised. The second picture is just simply an x-ray of a dislocated hip. Dislocated hips can be really painful. They can make personal hygiene and getting dressed really difficult and obviously something that we'd like to avoid if we can. So skeletal distortions are really destructive. We can, we're, obviously we can talk about the physical issues. Breathing can become difficult if your lungs are compressed, um, greater risk of pneumonia, aspiration of fluids, eating and digestion, everything from reflux to choking to constipation, we often see in those problems um, in people who have distorted body shapes. Skin breakdown, pressure injuries, what we used to call pressure ulcers are now called pressure injuries, but people actually develop skin breakdown, their skin gets macerated and broken down um, when they have deep folds with their pelvis and their ribs coming together, or they end up with wounds because they have dislocated hips and not enough padding on the outside. It's uh, very challenging, not to mention restricted ability to move and sit and see and communicate. Um, if you have a, a complex body shape, you can't sit up, you can't support yourself, it's going to be much more difficult for you to be able to interact with the world and sometimes even see around you. Socially, we see this here in Montana. Uh, we see it and when I teach in other parts of the country, and we definitely see it in Peru and other countries. The social impacts are absolutely huge. This is a real um, public health issue 
although rather a hidden one, because so often these people are hidden in their homes. They're hidden because once they get to be big enough, if they don't have a wheelchair, they can't be taken out any place. If their body shape is really complex from laying in a bed all the time, it's difficult to pick them up and carry them. You know, we, we see people coming in carrying 17-year-olds on their backs in blankets. You know, men carrying their 20-year-old sons in because they've never had a chance to be mobile in any other way. But this has a huge toll on these families, the financial struggles, parents often not able to go out and work um, because one has to stay at home to care for the kid, um, family and individual isolation socially, um, exhaustion from the physical care demands absolutely um, is a huge, huge issue. I've really come to feel very differently. There was a time when we began doing this work when I thought I understood about why, kid, why parents would give up their kids with disabilities to orphanages or to Mother Teresa's home or whatever. And I've really come to see it very differently now because I think sometimes those are decisions that are made out of love because it's going to be the best chance that they can give those kids. Also, if you have to choose between school fees for your able-bodied kids and a wheelchair or whatever for your disabled one, um, people have to make hard choices. And finally, psychological. Um, when people have very distorted body shapes, many of them are not able to speak to us and tell us exactly how they feel, but some of them are. And I can tell you from conversations I've had with people who have differently shaped bodies who are able to articulate, they talk about the loneliness, the isolation, the depression they feel, feeling like they're not accepted in society because they look different, feeling guilty because they always have to ask for help and they're dependent on caregivers. So there's this whole range, not just of the physical, but the social and psychological um, difficulties that happens when people's body shapes become distorted. So how can we combat these problems? That's what we're really here to talk about, especially where surgery and other medical management is not available. Because a lot of the people we work with in Peru, even if the surgery could be available, they don't have the money for it. We meet families whose kids have terrible seizure disorders and they have been prescribed medication, but the parents don't have any money to be able to buy the medication. So how can we combat these problems in these kinds of situations? Management of posture. That's what we're here to talk about tonight, 24-hour management of posture. It was discussed and developed in England since the 1970s. It's very new in the Americas. It's different than treatment. I see it as a foundation so that people who are going to be able to improve and rehabilitate are going to be able to have the healthiest, most aligned, straightest, strongest body that they can have so that they can really benefit from rehabilitation services. But for those with chronic conditions who are not going to improve, who don't have access to rehabilitation, it's even more important because if we can keep their bodies straighter and stronger so that they can breathe, so that they can eat, so that their systems function properly, life is going to be so much better for those people. The other thing that's wonderful about management of posture is that it can be used by anyone with movement problems and age doesn't matter, but intervening early does. I have taught about this subject at places like the Craig Hospital in Denver, which is a spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury center, um, the Spain Rehab Center in Birmingham, Alabama. These are places that work with people not born with cerebral palsy, but they've had um, injuries so that they're paraplegic or quadriplegic or they have a head injury. And these people also are benefiting from postural care because they go into the situation with their body being symmetrical, right? Almost all of us are born pretty much symmetrical. And if we can help those people with injuries stay symmetrical, long-term their lives are going to be of much better quality. Okay, so posture and disability. We're not talking about sitting up straight like your mother used to tell you, um, holding your shoulders back or whatever you might think. We're talking about postural stability with reasonable symmetry and midline orientation, which is something that most of us take for granted. This is our beautiful daughter, Eleanor, when she was almost five years old. 
And I use this picture when I'm teaching um, to show how hard she was working at age almost five just to be able to sit up in that chair. You can see that one hip is lower than the other. You can see that there's a curve in her spine. You can see that she's working pretty hard. And this is what we see in so many of the people um, who have motor disabilities, particularly um, ones like CP. This young lady is somebody that we met in Peru. And it's just an illustration of the asymmetrical lying postures that we're going to be talking about that can become so destructive. And it happens at night at a time when people would figure that they should be safe, when they're sleeping in their bed at night, when they would think that nothing bad would happen to them. That's when insidiously these problems can be worsening. So in 1976, a year after I graduated from occupational therapy school, two Scottish doctors published a paper in developmental medicine and child neurology. It's called Position as a Cause of Deformity in Children with Cerebral Palsy. And until that time, everybody just thought, if you have cerebral palsy, you're going to end up with scoliosis and dislocated joints and kind of turn into a pretzel because that's just what happens, and it's part of the package deal. But these doctors looked at two cohorts of young babies, one group diagnosed with cerebral palsy, one group diagnosed as being able-bodied, and they saw a lot of similarities in those babies early on. They saw similarities in their postures. They even saw some similarities in some, some asymmetries that the babies developed. But then, as they watched them over time, they saw that the able-bodied group began to be able to get up on all fours and eventually roll over, sit, move around, and their asymmetries disappeared. The CP group that were not able to do those milestones, their asymmetries continued on and they got worse and worse. And so they called this postural or positional molding. And they decided that habitual postures that you spend lots and lots and lots of time in are affecting your body because of gravity. So what we're talking about with 24-hour postural care is looking at the 24 hours in a day and really making good use of all of those times. It's not just about therapy. And ideally, yes, it is a really good wheelchair during the day, which is how Eleanor's project began our work in Peru. But it's also making use of the time outside of the wheelchair, especially the time in bed, okay, which can be 8 or 10 hours a day, um, sometimes even more, because a lot of people with disabilities spend more time in bed than, than those of us in this room do. So flexible bodies bounce back after movement. This is our former dog, Carter, as a demonstration of that. You know, she can curl up, she could straighten out. But when we don't move often enough, this is an image of what can happen, about how the body can change shape. This is an illustration of positional plagiocephaly, or flat head syndrome. You might have heard of it. A lot of babies these days are tending to have this problem, since all the babies are supposed to sleep on their backs, and they spend a lot of time in car seats and in strollers. And we actually see the shape of babies' um, skulls changing over time, and this is because of the head leaning to one side or even being upright, it can just get flattened on the back and the forces of gravity against the surface are changing that body shape. So this is an example of extreme postural molding like Fulford and Brown were talking about in 1976. This is a young man, uh, Mohammed, that we met in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan in 2006. He was 17 when this picture was taken. He was a small 17 because a lot of kids with cerebral palsy who have lots of tone have difficulty eating enough calories in order to really help themselves grow. They burn so many calories. So he was small for his age, but he had spent most of his life lying in this kind of position, okay? From the time that he was a baby because he couldn't move very well. He couldn't move out of it. He, there were no services. He lived in a very small village, five or six houses in the village, and he was related to all of them. Um, his family loved him, um, but they didn't know what to do with him. There wasn't any, anybody to tell them. And when we sat him up, 
you can exactly see what has happened to his body, how he has flattened, okay? From lying, this is the side of his body that he was laying on all the time. This is the side that was up top. His mother is pointing to how his pelvis and his rib cage are overlapping, which is not how it's supposed to be. If any of you want to check, you know, go home tonight, you have a little gap here between your pelvis and your rib cage. That's how we're all supposed to be. But um, Muhammad was not. So if a person has a limited movement repertoire, I'm going to show you a little series here so you'll understand what I talk about with a limited movement repertoire. It's not about just only about not being able to move at all. It's if you move, but you never really change all that much when you're moving. This was, I took this series of pictures last month in Peru. Now, when I took this one, I thought, oh, she's really, she's going to do something different, you know. But then she didn't. Can you all see the similarity about how these postures are different, but not really? They're always in the same direction. There's a little bit of variability. This is what we call a limited movement repertoire. Sometimes parents will tell me, oh, but my child moves a lot. But then when we start looking at it, we see, well, yeah, moving, but then you always come and you rest in the same position all the time. And this is why lying and sitting are linked. So this little girl is only three years old. She was really tired and unhappy, so that's what is going on with the crying face. But I hope you can see the subtlety of what I'm trying to show here because you can see how she's always tending to go to her left side. And if you look at where her left leg, her posture is tending to go, it's even when she's sitting, it's tending to go in that same direction. And unless that can be counteracted over time, she is going to be at great risk of developing a more distorted body shape. So we start off with a limited movement repertoire, okay, not a lot of choices in the position. Those limited choices become associated with, it, with relaxation because that's all you ever get to do. That preferred posture becomes habitual because you do it all the time. The body flattens on the support surface like a human sandwich, and the posture becomes obligatory as the body shape changes. We talk about a human sandwich. It's like you've got the table here, you've always got gravity, and the person is in the middle between the support surface. We all work and move against gravity all the time, but we don't tend to get stuck the way this kiddo did. This is a very typically developing little newborn baby moving in typical asymmetry, which is what newborn babies do. This is a kiddo that we met last year in Peru. Um, pretty similar posture, only he's eight or nine years old, and he got stuck. Another example of getting stuck. And two sisters, 14 years apart. Aureli, age three, Diana, age 17, met them last year. I hope you can all see that Aureli, who has cerebral palsy, still has a pretty nice symmetrical body shape. This is her beautiful mother holding her head. And um, my colleague Elizabeth and I are measuring her body symmetry because her mother is doing night postural care with her. This is her older sister, Diana, age 17, who also has cerebral palsy, an enormous, profound scoliosis in her back. This leg is dislocated out the front. This leg is dislocated out the back. And I know because her mother showed me that when she was the age of Aureli, she looked about the same. Her mother pulled out a photo and showed me that Diana once looked like Arlie. So 14 years later, this is what we have without an intervention. So how do we do postural management? We provide postural support for people, not only during the day, but at night. We don't allow destructive, unsupported postures. We don't let them lie on those crooked ways. We don't let them hang over the side of a wheelchair without having something to support them in the middle. We provide gentle support if the distortions are already present because sometimes we can actually improve those if we go about it in the right way. But even if we can't improve them, we can help people be more comfortable. For instance, Diana is now sleeping much better and breathing better, her mother told me, since she began to do postural care. So 
the hope is that her little sister is going to be protected from those distortions, but even now, Diana is able to sleep more comfortably at night. We never do anything harsh or uncomfortable. The whole focus on this is that people have to be able to be comfortable or they're not going to tolerate any kind of intervention. So, why care for posture at night? The advantages are that gravity is in our favor. It's much easier to control a person's posture when they're lying down than when they're sitting up. Gentle support towards symmetry over a prolonged time. It's like a very, very, very gentle prolonged stretch that can actually gradually correct a body shape. During deep sleep, muscle tone relaxes. This is something that happens with all of us. In our sleep stages of sleep stage four and three and REM sleep, um, we all experience deep muscle tone relaxation and this is a huge help for helping to, to use postural molding to our advantage because it's gonna let us correct problems. But empowering families is the key. I'm briefly going to show you a result of a girl here in Montana, and then we will go on, you know, go, go on back to, to Peru. We haven't really talked about Peru very much. This is just the background so that you'll know what we're talking about. Mary's story. She is one of our Montana Postural Care Project kids from last year. I met her in March 2016. This was the picture her mother sent me of how she used to sleep every night. When I met her in 2016, this was as straight as we could get her to lie. This is a picture that her mother sent me in January 2017. It's quite a big change. And the way that we did that was by providing her with comfortable, gentle supports to sleep in at night. She's no longer wearing her brace, her body jacket, to sleep in at night, which made her sleep very much more difficult than it usually um, would be. She's much happier sleeping without her brace. Um, we've got a little leg pillow here to support her legs in improved alignment. We're able to get a really good correction of her scoliosis. These are measurements I took of her chest, March 2016. She's got a three centimeter difference between the center of her chest out to the right and out to the left. In only just five or six months, that had shrunk considerably to uh, actually less than a two centimeter difference. And I saw her in January, we remeasured her. Look at this, she is now almost exactly symmetrical. Um, two tenths of a centimeter difference between her right and left sides. And I just got a text this morning from her mother. She is ecstatic. On x-ray, her scoliosis has gone from 40 degrees to 20 degrees. She is so happy. So this is what we are working with back in Peru. So again, Lima, San Juan de Lurigancho, the areas that we're talking about. San Mandro Lurigancho itself has about 260,000 people, or Canto Grande. Um, San Mandro Lurigancho, the whole district, has as many people as we have here in the state of Montana, a million. There's an elevated poverty level and crime rate relative to South America. Some people have actually told us that the area around Canto Grande is one of the most crime-ridden and dangerous areas of any place in South America. Um, when we're working at Yankanawasi, we are not allowed to go out into the illegal market that, is, that surrounds it um, because it's deemed to not be safe for us. And I actually had a little taste of that last month um, when some, a, a gang hit um, some of the shops out there just as we were getting ready to leave and we had to scurry back inside. They have disability diagnoses similar to ours. Um, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, spina bifida, genetic syndromes, a lot of the things that we see here. But there is a higher than average prevalence of disabilities um, because of nutrition, environmental factors, including pollution and toxic materials, um, healthcare access. So this is the population that we're working with. And we are working with them at Yankanawasi and I'm unashamed to say that Yankanawasi is one of my favorite places to be in the world. 
Um, it's Quechua is an indigenous language of Peru, and Yancano Masi means house of work. Only it's not, work isn't even a totally accurate translation. It's also almost more like house of activity, house of play. It, it's hard to actually translate it into English. Um, here's a little, a little scene from Yankanawasi. You can see all the wheelchairs lined up there. These are some moms talking with the director at Yankanawasi. This is the little special education kindergarten class. They have a 35-year history of disability outreach. It's quite amazing. Um, they are an outreach of the Congregacion de Santa Cruz, the Holy Cross fathers who um, began doing this integrated support for those with disabilities and their families 35 years ago. Um, they are really into promoting social policy change and best practice, um, not just in the church, but in social organizations and in Peru. And they do a lot of outreach to the community. So, quick history of our work with them. 2007, we provided 25 wheelchairs in, um, at Yankanawasi. In 2008, we did our first wheelchair training workshop. By 2009, they had decided that they should get a biomechanical workshop going, and they had it built. In 2010, I, I had been doing some training with an interpreter for parents. In 2010, I was thrilled when they said, we don't need you to do this anymore. We've got it. We just want you to be here in case there's any questions, but we've got it. And I was thrilled to see them doing a great job of teaching parents. In 2011, we sponsored the first Yankanawasi therapist to go to the Latin American Seating Symposium. It was the first year that symposium occurred. We have continued to sponsor therapists to go there every year that the symposium happens, every two years. In 2012, and 2013, 24-hour postural care was added to the training, the training that we provided to them, and the training that they began to provide to families. Um, Yankana began an outreach to La Merced and La Arroya. These are areas out in the jungle. Um, La Arroya is a decimated area that was a former site of mining, and it's become very polluted. Um, these are places we've never been, but Yankana has begun outreach there. Um, over the last few years, they have expanded their outreach. They're now going to Chimbote and Kamana. We will probably be going with them to Kamana next year to support the work that they're starting in developing a disability program. And this is what I'm really proud of. Um, Yank the Yankanawasi occupational therapists, the two leads, um, put together an abstract for the Latin American Seating Symposium for a poster session, and we just heard last week that it was accepted. And so these young people have gone in a very short time from just starting to learn about this stuff to really being leaders and doing outreach, and now they are actually going to be sharing at the Latin American Seating Symposium about their unique program of wheelchair service, which includes 24-hour postural care. So these are just some pictures of some of their family training sessions, pictures that they've shared with me. Um, I think this one was taken actually in La Merced. Um, teaching families about the basics of wheelchair maintenance and um, seated posture and how to take care of the chairs. Then teaching the families and demonstrating about posture, postural care in the lying position while kids are sleeping at night. Um, this is another um, workshop that took place um, at Yankanawasi. They've actually set up a chair with different pelvic belts, just like wheelchair pelvic belts, so that the parents can feel what it's like to have the belts on that their kids use. And these are just some images to show you the difference that can be made for kids. This little kid, um, the picture's a little blurry, I'm sorry, it's just what was sent to me. Um, but he's one of the kids, he's an outreach kid from out in the provinces. You can see his body is so out of control. His head is tilted back. He can't really do anything. He's very stuck. His knees are crossing. This puts his hips at great risk for dislocating. And here's an image of Sandrita, one of my OT colleagues, as she is demonstrating for his family and for the people in the class how he can be relaxed and be positioned in a healthier way for his body that it is possible to actually help his muscle tone relax. And look at the difference 
in his face. It's like he's ready to interact now instead of just being stuck. Another boy, this is a real extreme um, sort of scoliosis when you look at it this way. Um, but even he could be corrected a little bit and was made much more comfortable and I think happier um, in the second picture. Another girl, you know, these are just images that they, they t go on these outreach trips and then um, send me pictures so I can see what they're doing. This is a pretty shocking and horrifying picture, actually. I think if all of us tried to put our legs into that position, we wouldn't be able to do it. And the reason that that child is like that is because his hips are dislocated on both sides and they're dislocated out the front, which is a really painful situation. And he was in a tremendous amount of pain, but they were actually able to relax him enough so that they could slip his legs out of that really awkward posture and teach his family how to support him so that he is um, in a healthier place. And finally, just another teenage kiddo. So I'm going to show you a little story about Emily. Emily is 17 years old. We met her last month. Um, she has cerebral palsy, hemiplegic cerebral palsy, so she is um, much more affected on one side of her body than the other. Um, she, her mother died, I don't know how long ago, but it's sometime in the last few years her mother died. So her dad is, is a single dad and loves her dearly. He was late to the appointment and was apologizing completely because he said, well, he said, I'm, I'm doing the job of both a mother and a father now and it's really hard, but I don't care because I love her. <laughs> that was what he told us. So a much loved girl. But you can see as she lies down here on the mat in our clinic area, she's not lying straight, is she? She's kind of going over to one side. Her legs go over to one side. Um, this hip is not dislocated, but it's pretty much on the edge. Here's her father, and this is Elizabeth, the lead OT at Yankanawasi. And she was asking the dad to show her how he positions Emily at night when she's sleeping. Now this dad has already come to a workshop to learn about this because when kids or young adults or adults get wheelchairs at Yankanawasi, before they get the wheelchair they're required to get some education. So they come and they learn about the basic parts of a wheelchair and how to take care of it to keep it in good shape and basic aspects of wheelchair seating positioning and then they also have to come to a workshop about 24-hour postural care and they sign a document when they receive the wheelchair that they will care for the wheelchair, that they will keep it in a safe place, that they will do 24-hour postural care. And so it's, it's very much a, a holistic program. So this guy had already been educated, but he was struggling with uh, trying to be able to get the supports in the right place and getting them to stay there. So Elizabeth, demonstrated and I just snapped some pictures as she was doing this. She put out a sheet um, on, the, on the mat table and, and um, put Emily back down on it. There's actually some, well, some layers of non-slip mesh, a double layer of non-slip um, rug matting that we got at a store in Lima at a sort of a hardware store type place. And she actually put the supports rolled up between that stuff so that it would stay in place and then she just rolls the sheet up into a sort of a tube to give support for Emily at her sides. And here's Emily all set up, um, relaxed in her positioning um, that her dad is going to be able to um, carry on at home. And here she is in her new wheelchair um, interacting and having a good time with one of the young women on our team. And these will be the components of her 24-hour postural care, that when she is awake during the day, she's going to be well supported in a chair that doesn't let her hang out over the sides or slide out. And at night, she will be um, well supported, as you see here. Irily, Indiana, we already met them a little while ago. Why early intervention is so important. Here are pictures that I took of these two girls, and look at the similarity in their postures, right? And we know, because she showed me the picture, the mom showed me the picture, that this girl looked a lot like this when she was this size. 
14 years ago. So we can look at this, and it's pretty easy, I think, to get an idea of where this is going to go if we just let it be. And her mother doesn't want to let it be. She very, very, very much wants to save this little one from what has happened to her big sister. So here are the girls in their sleep systems. Um, you can see there's a pretty big difference um, between our Elise sleep system and how symmetrical she is. Her mother um, rolls up supports inside a sheet. What, what the moms do actually is they lay the kids down on a sheet and then they roll up the supports around them underneath so that they stay in place. Um, she has pretty high supports under her knees because her little knees are pretty tight and if we don't put those supports under her knees they'll fall to one side or the other and that's going to tend to dislocate her hips and change the shape of her back. So um, that's why she's set up that way. But you can see that um, her situation is much, much different than Deanna. Deanna also has side supports. Um, she's got things to support all of her joints as much as possible. And as I told you, her mother says that since she began sleeping this way, she sleeps much better at night. But the reality is we're not going to be able to change her dislocated hips and her very, very profoundly distorted back. In a very practical sense, our release wheelchair, done in one hour, these two people, these two people did the wheelchair for this little girl. Here she is after an hour. She ended up being there the whole day because of her big sister. But there she is with her oldest brother taking a snooze in her chair, which was done by this OT and the OT student working with her. Two people, she looks beautiful, and it was a pretty easy job. In contrast, Deanna's wheelchair, which was an all-day job. You can see me here meditating on how we are going to complete this back. This is a back that has been created to accommodate her very, very, very differently shaped spine. And we did manage to succeed it. But if this picture looks a little dark to you, I, cro I cropped the picture down a little bit so it was just the people. But up in this corner, you can actually see the clock, and it was 7 PM. <laughs> it was a long day's work. And it took all of us in order to be able to achieve this result for Diana so that there would be a chair that she could tolerate sitting in. So it's pretty obvious that we want to try and avoid and prevent these kinds of complications rather than have to deal with them um, once they're already a problem. So the elements of success at Young Kanawasi are their organization. Their lead occupational therapist is sort of the lead person for um, all of the positioning and mobility equipment piece of the work that they're doing right now. Um, there has been education for all of the professionals. All of the occupational and physical therapists at Young Kanawasi um, have been educated in how to do proper wheelchair evaluations, how to do measurements, um, and um, most of them in 24-hour postural care, but not all of them. We just had an additional, really a whole week of education for them a month ago when we were um, when we were there, one of our team members, who is a native Spanish speaker and a wonderful therapist and wheelchair specialist, spent an entire day training all of the therapists at Young Kanawasi um, to bring along the ones who were less experienced to be at a higher level. And then she spent the rest of the week mentoring them in actual seating situations. So there's the education for the professionals, but also, as I've already shared with you, education for the family. So people aren't just being given stuff and not knowing how to do it, not knowing how to take care of it. Um, they've actually had some education. And I'll be very blunt, there have been many times that I have wished to myself that the families I work with here in Montana could have workshops like that because I think sometimes things would go way, way better for the kids who get wheelchairs here if there could be an element of education instead of people just being given stuff. And finally, there's follow-up. As I already mentioned, the families commit to postural care and care for the wheelchair. And if they don't follow through on that, then they will no longer be able to receive services. They have follow-up appointments every six months or as needed. 
Um, they pay for those follow-up appointments. It's, you know, in our funds, it would be about $3. You know, for them, it's 15 soles, which for some families is a lot to come up with, but they find creative ways, and they're doing this because people really value something that they put some money into. And so people pay 10 soles. They don't pay for the wheelchairs because we bring those into the country duty-free, but they pay 10 soles for a really thorough, wonderful, professional wheelchair evaluation from a trained therapist, something that they wouldn't be able to get most other places in Peru. They pay 10 soles for that. They pay 15 soles for the follow-up appointments. Um, Yankana now has an organization where every Wednesday they have a wheelchair clinic. They typically provide three wheelchairs on Wednesdays. Every Friday is when they have their follow-up appointments. And they do have capacity for on-site repairs and maintenance of the wheelchairs. The, this is all in line with the World Health Organization guidelines for responsible wheelchair service provision in less resourced parts of the world. Finally, I just have to show you Jesus. Jesus is a delightful young man. He's 22. This, here he is with his wonderful parents, his mother Lucia. I can't remember his dad's name. Might be Carlos. Anyway. 22 years ago, this young man was born at about six or seven months gestation. And his mother told me that she carried him around inside her clothes like a kangaroo. He was a tiny, tiny, fragile, fragile baby. Um, they just became acquainted with Yang Kanawasi in January. And by February, they were implementing night postural care. He didn't have a good wheelchair yet. He didn't get that. Um, no, no, he, he had, he, it, the chair wasn't finished until March. He had started to get it in February. But the reason I have these pictures here is that I hope you can see these red dotted lines and realize what I'm trying to show you there is that just from February to the beginning of April, already things have gotten better for this young man. His mother is thrilled because she says that he breathes so much better. She noticed an immediate change in his breathing at night while he's sleeping since he's been better supported. Um, Elizabeth, his therapist, noticed that he's less windswept, and by that we mean that his legs are able to move a little bit more toward the middle than they could before. And if you look at where this, what this line is showing you, I've tried to the best of my ability start at the middle of where his head would be if it weren't turned to the side and just have that straight line going down. And you can actually see that he is moving over towards the middle a little bit more and he's also able to hold his head in the middle more when he's lying down. His mother, he, he actually had numerous surgeries um, when he was younger at a place called Clinica San Juan de Dios. I guess the closest thing I would liken it to would be like Shriners Hospitals in the United States. They did some surgeries on his legs. Um, they didn't help. She watched him turn into the shape that he is today. And as she and I talked together, she said, nobody told me. Why didn't somebody tell me that I could do this? And I said, because they don't know. They didn't know. This just new. This has been going on for 40 years. People have been talking about this in England. They are way, way ahead of us. I went to England. I, I had been working with it on my own um, through just how I positioned my own daughter. And in Eng I went to England in 2012, got more training. I've been studying up. Um, I've made it my goal to try and expose as many people as possible in North America, but also in South America, because this is a really life-giving thing that could um, be a game changer for people. So, the missing link. Could it be that management of posture day and night is the missing link to help some of these people with severe and complex disabilities? That is my question. And if you would like to read any more about this, I've got our websites up there. Um, Eleanor's project at Posture 24-7 is um, focuses on the work that we're doing at the Montana Postural Care Project and here in the United States. And I just thank all the families who are let me use their kids' pictures and who are involved in this work. And thank you for listening. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, we have time for questions. Yes. 
what kind of options are there uh, for like paying um, a lot of the expenses that some of these families can't uh, come up with the three dollars or whatever to pay for some of this? Is there what kind of community-based things do they utilize? Some of them save up the money so that they can afford to pay it. For the people who really, really, really can't um, come up with it in any way, shape, or form, sometimes they find other ways, um, like helping out at Young Kanawasi, you know, um, doing some volunteer work, things of that nature. For instance, when we were in the warehouse on March 13th, um, where all of our wheelchairs had come through customs, um, we were there working for two days, and on both of those days, there were six or seven parents, not always parents, sometimes uncles, family members of kids who were going to get wheelchairs who came and helped with all the heavy lifting and the shifting. So they do those kinds of creative things too. Yes? Um, how much pain are they in? Like, is anything when you're trying to align their bodies? Well, that's a good question. Um, when we start doing postural care, and when we're doing wheelchair seating, we never put somebody in a position that is painful. So, you know, I've given you a really quick, you know, run around because I, I teach like full one day and two day courses on this subject sometimes, but there's an evaluation process where you're really looking at what kind of positions a person can achieve and what they can't do. Um, what is going to be painful, what isn't. We never take people to the range of movement or to the extreme where there's going to be pain. So we see what they're able to do and then we back off a little bit. And what we actually find oftentimes is that once you start building up supports around people, their pain diminishes. They actually can relax better and they can let go and their pain diminishes. Yes? Um, you mentioned a lot of people with asymmetrical body forms tend to deal with mental, um, or at least like uh, depression and things like that. I was wondering if there's any like room for expansion for like mental health evaluation in this sort of program as people like progress through. Uh, I don't think we can do that. It's a good point though. And, and you know, that's just really something that has come up, um, you know, in, in discussions. I think oftentimes when people can't speak, it's easy to think that they don't have much to say, which is actually not true. They may not be able to say um, how they feel or, or what they're thinking, but I'm pretty sure that everybody is feeling and thinking something, even if we don't know what it is. And the few people we actually have on, on um, well, it's on the Posture 24-7 um, Facebook page. If you go there, we actually, and, and on our website actually too in the blog, we actually have um, about a 15-minute video posted there that was made by a young woman here in Montana who lives in Plains, Montana, and has cerebral palsy, has a distorted body shape, has pretty severe scoliosis, um, but is very articulate and able to speak. And she actually did a video talking about what it feels like to live in her body. And she talks about the physical pain and the social and the psychological stuff. We have a lot of work ahead of us, you know, in our cultures and our societies all around the world, and I include us here in Montana um, and in our country. Well, thank you for letting me. Oh, another one, yes. Um, so you said you wish there was more education in Montana. Is there like not programs like 24 7 posture or something like that? More education in Montana? Yeah, when you're um, talking about. Um, the success of the um, Montenegro um, project? The success of the postural care project? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we are actually doing education in Montana. That's what the Montana Postural Care Project is all about. We're fortunate enough to get um, funding from the Montana Council on Developmental Disabilities. This is our second year. And actually, what we are trying to do is to develop evidence and show that it actually really does work. Because one of the problems, I, you may or may not be aware of a term that a lot of people throw around nowadays called evidence-based practice, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based treatment. 
I have actually become exceedingly fond of the term evidence-informed practice because I'm, you can't always just take each individual person and jam them into the um, objective evidence. But the point is that we do need to be able to show that this actually works because until we can show some of the things that I've showed you today, um, people are not going to be willing to adopt postural care as a standard of care. You know, to be, to be very blunt, um, the approach at this point in time, for the most part in our country, including in Montana, is that dislocations and scoliosis and such, you know, are watched. Maybe a little bit of bracing is done, and they're watched until they get bad enough to have surgery. That's what happens. Um, I mean, it, 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 fe it sounds horrifying to me, but I've had a parent say to me, well, his one hip is already dislocated and they're just going to wait until the other one gets bad enough and then they'll do them both at the same time. You know, this is the kind of, I'm, I'm not truly not trying to be critical. It's just, I mean, this is all, this is what people are used to. Um, this is what they're accustomed to. And so people think, well, the only way you can fix this is if you do an operation. And, and you all know, I mean, our society is not big on prevention, right? I mean, preventive medicine, you know, we're all told the things that we ought to try and keep ourselves or be doing to help ourselves stay healthy. And that's like an ongoing battle. Try and talk about preventing this stuff from happening. So, you know, we're trying really hard through Posture 24-7, and we're doing this in Peru with Eleanor's Project, which is why I'm here tonight, because we're talking about international stuff. Um, I'm really excited. I'm going to get to speak at the first natural con national conference on children, disability, and functioning in Medellin, Colombia in November. Um, the people there have seen some of what's happening in Peru, and they're really excited to get it going in Colombia. Um, but it's, we've got a long ways to go in this country, a very long ways to go. You know, as long as surgeries are funded by insurance and Medicaid and Medicare, and preventive things like this are not, um, it's going to be an uphill battle. So. I think we have one question back here, and then I have several questions. Uh, yes. Hi. Oh, I was just going to ask, how long do the bedtime routine, well, I don't know if you it, but the, when they're like, being supported at night, how long does that usually take? It's probably, as they get practice, it gets faster. Oh, you mean like the extra time to put somebody to bed? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, that's a good question because sometimes people think it's going to be a really big hassle and really laborious and stuff. Um, but once you get it down, you know, most, for most people, it's just a few minutes. You know, it's like anything. You're, when you start a new routine, it's awkward and you're trying to figure it out, and especially until you get all the parts and pieces. Um, but most people work out strategies, and it just takes a couple of extra minutes. And I've had, I had one mother tell me, the way she put it was so cute. She said, well, it's only five more minutes, and look at the benefits. That was her way of talking about it. Yeah, I think my first question kind of relates to this, and I, maybe I understand the answer now, but I, it's kind of a question based on ignorance, and that is, you know, I'm thinking of the, of the nighttime situation where you're, you're propped up, you're pillowed, your, uh, you've got those uh, sheets that are by your side. What if you have to relieve yourself? <laughs> That's a really good practical question. Um, it does make it a little bit more complicated. One thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the people we're talking about here end up wearing diapers, um, or if they don't, they don't have the physical capacity to be able to take care of that by themselves anyway. So they're going to need some level of assistance. If, if, none of the people that you saw today are people who, you know, even if they do use the toilet, they would not be able to do that by themselves. They would need a lot of assistance. So, you know, whether they're supported while they're sleeping at night or not, they're going to need help with that. Uh, my second question has to do with um, location. Um, do you think that it's better to go back to the same place year after year? Or would, it, would you want to start at a place, do some things, and then move on to another place? What's your, what's your thinking on return to the same place? And is that part of what you're planning to do also as well? 
That's a really good question. That's actually kind of interesting. Um, I'm thinking about a, a, a new colleague and I are thinking about doing a presentation at next year's International Seating Symposium, and the title of it is going to be What Happens When You Keep Going Back? <laughs> um, I've known people who really enjoy just being able to go to different places, you know, be someplace one at a time or maybe a couple of times and then move on. I would say that what we've learned, and, and part of it has been that we had to kind of learn as we were going along how to do things better. Um, but I really do think that had we left Yankanawasi a few years ago, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, there were some things that we had to learn. For instance, when we first started at Yankanawasi, we put a lot of energy into training one person. Um, the lead occupational therapist. Well, then he left for another job and somebody took his place. And then we really invested in her and sent her to the Latin American Seating Symposium. And then she left and went to a new job. And that was like, wait just a minute, this is not sustainable. You know, so this is why this year we're sending two therapists to the Seating Symposium, not one. And four physical therapists and four occupational therapists have all you know, are all coming together as a group. So I think over time we've learned a lot more about how to make things sustainable. Um, certainly there are benefits to going to a new place and starting something new. I'm not sure I have it in me to do that right now because the, the other aspect that I would say is that, I didn't dwell on this, but it, it took a while for us to find the right partner that we could really make these gains. You saw that we worked in Jordan for four years. We ended that um, work, not because we didn't like Jordan, we loved Jordan. Um, and, and there will always be a special place in my heart for Jordan, but we were not able to find a consistent partner to work with year after year after year who really wanted to make a sustainable work and who would follow up when we were not there. At the same time, we did have the relationship with Yankanawasi developing in Peru, so when I had to choose between the two countries, it's like, okay, well, it's going to have to be Peru because we don't have anybody sustainable here. It took us a few years to find Yankanawasi. They were not the first group we started working with in Peru. We began working with somebody else 2004 through 2007. We ended it because, again, you know, it, it, it's, it's, if you don't have a solid in-country partner who is going to be committed and be continuing the work throughout the year when you're not there, you're not going to be able to do anything sustainable. And um, so sometimes it's, it's kind of a trial and error till you find the right place. Rick, yeah. Yes, I'd just like to add something. One thing that we learned as a parent of Eleanor is kids grow. So you get a wheelchair that fits a kid when they're three years old. And as you, know, you saw with the three-year-old kid and the 16-year-old kid, there's a size difference. Somebody has to make sure that that wheelchair grows with the child. So one of our, our big foci is that whole issue of sustainability and who's going to be there to manage those changes. And that's, you know, that for me is a big thing. The other thing is trust. You develop relationships with people like with Jose Antonio, the director of Yankanawasi. We trust him, he trusts us. You know, and that gets you a lot of information, it gets you contacts, it gets you just a, a tremendous amount of things that are intangibles but very, very valuable and extremely necessary for an ongoing kind of social change project. Yeah, one of the reasons I asked that question is because I did a review of this book called Doing Development, and it's a review of the work of this professor of anthropology at Duke University take students, every year he's been doing this for 25 years now, uh, to uh, Togo. And he's found that it's best to go back to the same place because of this whole point about trust. People trust you now, you've built up that kind of trust, and they actually really look forward to you coming back and, 
and, mm -hmm. and this a whole different group of students that go back each time, but they are embraced, they're welcomed, and, and so forth. So I think you're right that that trust element is a really important part of it. So I have one last question, and that is, um, I like to ask this question of everybody. Um, what have you learned from the work in Peru that has that you can take back here to Montana and use to improve the situation in Montana. You're, you're in a great position here because you're doing work in both places. And I, I love to ask this question, but um, what is it that you learn from Peru that you can use in terms of reverse learning and bring back here? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a big one. I will tell you that I tend to get really cranky when I've just been in Peru and then I come home and people are no-shows for appointments when all they have to do is drive around town. <laughs> I do get really cranky about that. And it happens almost every time. You know, that when you've seen people coming in carrying a 17-year-old on their back and they've had to walk three hours to the bus stop and then catch another bus for five hours and then they arrive and somebody in Missoula um, is a no-show for an appointment and they just had to drive around town. I, I do get cranky. Um, but I, I, I do think that I've learned a lot about the commonality among people. There's really not a lot of difference between us. Whether you're in South America, North America, the Middle East, India, where Rick and I did our first volunteer work in the 1980s, um, we are all so similar inside. And it's easy sometimes, I think, for us as Americans to think that we are further along than people in some other countries. Um, and maybe in terms of the technology or being able to have easier access to those things like surgeries, um, maybe that is true. But in terms of some of the basics that really matter. Um, I think that we need to learn um, more than think that we can only give. I've, I've certainly learned a lot. I'm not being articulate here at all. I've, I've learned a lot about what really is important and what really matters. Well, let me suggest one other thing, see how you feel about this. I think you've already hinted at this. I think one of the things that you've learned is that we tend to rely more than we need to on surgeries in this yeah. country. Ah. And that in other places, they're able to come up with so non-surgical solutions that are preventative and, uh, uh, and help out as well. So uh, it seems to me like you've already made that point. Well, I guess I have. <laughs> well, uh, you know, please join me once again in thanking Tamara for a really interesting